good afternoon. I'm Monica Hendrickson, the Public Health Administrator for the Peoria City County Health Department, and welcome to our weekly COVID update. For Thursday, September 30th, the Tri-County region now sits at 52,081 cases total. That's an increase of 569 over the past week. That brings Peoria with an additional 262 cases to 26,407. Tazewell, with an additional 230 cases, bringing them to 19,977. And lastly, Woodford County, with an additional 77 cases to 5,697. The Tri-County is reporting one additional death over the past week, bringing our two-date total to 814. That death was attributed to a Peoria County resident. Currently, we have 830 active cases at home and isolating, and another 29 cases hospitalized in the Tri-County. Our seven-day average for the Tri-County now sits at 81 new cases each day, which continues to decline over the past few weeks. Peoria County also saw a decline, now at 37 new cases each day as our seven-day average. We also report in Peoria County that the highest number of our active cases are amongst zero to nine-year-olds. They currently account for 20% of the active cases in Peoria County. We consider active cases those that are either at home isolating or hospitalized. The next largest group is our 10 to 19, which is at 17%, and then sitting at 14% of our active cases is our 30 to 39 and 50 to 59 year old population. Our hospitals, OSF, St. Francis Medical Center, and Unity Point Health Central Illinois are reporting 16 ICU beds in use and 69 non-ICU beds in use. Again, our ICU continues to drop with a seven-day average now at 15 beds in use daily for just COVID-19. And our non-ICU capacity continues to actually increase up to 58 beds in use. Uh, related to COVID-19. Overall, we've passed that 51% mark in Peoria County for fully vaccinated at 51.1%. Tazewell is at 50.7% and Woodford is at 48.3%. Last week, we discussed a little bit about the information coming from ACIP that was relatively new. Um, and to speak more about the implications of boosters and the importance of vaccinations, we have with us from UI Comp Infectious Disease Physician and Assistant Professor at OSF, uh, Denise, Dr. Denise uh, Francisco. So good afternoon, everyone. As said, I'm Dr. Denise Francisco, and I'm one of the infectious disease physicians over at OSF and UICOM. I wanted to talk a little bit about what's important right now, which is prevention. And the news has all been buzzing about um, uh, the uh, different kinds of booster shots and uh, what and who could get it. So first, let's look at the information that we have. We have three current FDA approved um, uh, vaccines. One is the Pfizer vaccine, which uh, could be given for anyone uh, age 12 and above, the Moderna vaccine at 18 and above, and so is the Janssen or J&J &J vaccine at also 18 and above. Now, there are two kinds of uh, third doses that we have to think about. One is what we call an extra dose, and that is given for people who are immunocompromised. An immunocompromised means patients who either have, um, number one, any uh, transplants, either solid organ or stem cell transplants, where their immune system is low. Anyone who also have um, cancers or malignancies that could affect their immune system. And um, HIV patients who are not controlled and have low um, immune systems with a CD4 count. 
For that, they could actually get a third dose because their immune, um, their immune system is uh, low, and they could get that as much as four weeks after the initial, uh, the, the two-dose vaccines for either the Moderna or the Pfizer. Now, the other um, thought would be booster shots. This is new data and uh, new recommendations from the ACIP and the CDC. And it's important to note that as of now, only patients who have taken or have received the Pfizer vaccine are um, eligible for the booster shots. The Moderna and J&J &J vaccines, we, they are still trying to um, get data and present it to the um, FDA and CDC for approval. So who could get this? So this would be um, anyone, number one, 65 years and older who have already received their, um, their Pfizer vaccine in the last six months, uh, at least six months ago. So, and also anyone who's above 18 and older who either, number one, have um, uh, underlying medical conditions, a lot of those uh, branch from either chronic kidney disease, chronic lung disease like COPD um, or asthma, uh, diabetes mellitus, um, uh, even smokers, either current or former smokers, and a whole list of the um, eligible underlying medical conditions could be seen in the CDC website. The other uh, population that's above 18 would be the ones who live or work in a high-risk environment or setting. So what does that mean? Number one would be anyone who lives in long-term care settings. Uh, so um, anyone who lives in either a rehab or one of the uh, areas who are at high risk of getting and spreading uh, COVID-19. Also, uh, uh, under that would be workers, including um, healthcare workers or first responders, and even people who are uh, working in schools or the education staff, all the way down to even grocery, grocery store workers, public transit um, workers, and um, postal service workers. So anyone who are at high risk settings. And it's also very important to note that we are going, and we are currently in the uh, flu season, and uh, the flu shot is vitally important. So both shots could definitely be given at the same time. So make sure that everyone gets vaccinated with the flu and, of course, with the COVID vaccine. Thank you. We're open for um, any questions. Yes, the booster shots have already started. So um, from what I've heard, you could go to any um, uh, CVS or any pharmacy that is available, and you just assess that you're either one who's eligible either through age, through underlying medical conditions, or through high-risk settings, and they will be able to receive it. Um, that, it, I think it depends on which uh, pharmacy or um, hospital you actually are getting it from. Is there any update on, uh, I know kids and vaccines has been, has been a big topic and the timeline for that. Uh, uh, where is the timeline? I know with Pfizer, it's getting some in, you know, it's data so far. Yeah, so the Pfizer data has been um, very uh, promising, especially for the younger. As of now, as I said, it's uh, 12 years and older at least. But um, hopefully with, uh, as the data comes in and as the CDC and the FDA, again, goes through the data that Pfizer has, um, we'll hopefully have some news um, in the near future. Oh, no worries. Unfortunately, I won't, uh, I'm not privy to that information as of now. No, definitely, definitely. Um, and I think now that with the younger population, zero to nine, and uh, the ones who cannot get vaccinated as of now, we'll have definitely more data, and hopefully that would be uh, that would push um, uh, them to uh, figure out if it's definitely safe. But as I said, it is promising at this time.
that group now makes up a fifth of cases in it is very important, but also while we're waiting for data to, um, to come back, it's also very important for their family members, their friends, their teachers to get vaccinated so that they would be able to be protected as of now while we're waiting for the final CDC and FDA approval for that age group. Thank you. Open up to questions. Kind of following up a little bit on the, the zero to nine age group again. You mentioned before that a lot of these transmissions aren't necessarily happening in school, but outside school settings. I mean, is that still the case where these are the majority of the transmissions? So what we're seeing in our zero to nine population, which uh, it correctly does make up um, one out of five of our cases right now. It is not happening within the classroom setting. And I, again, that's because our schools have done a lot of mitigation and control methods in the classroom setting, such as universal masking. A lot of our schools have a test to stay policy, and as well as exclusion principles related to whether or not students are symptomatic and making sure people are getting tested before returning back into the classroom. So our schools have placed a lot of mitigation, and we're seeing the impacts where we're not seeing spread in the classroom setting. We're seeing it everywhere, and I think the doctor mentioned it perfectly, which is while we wait for that, that age range to be eligible for the vaccine, you know, we have to do our part. The community around them has to protect them by one, getting vaccinated, but also wearing masks, um, staying home when they're ill, getting tested. Those are still key to help protect that smaller age range. You said that the zero to nine population accounts for one to five of our cases, or is it zero to 19 population? The zero to nine population accounts for 20% of our cases in Peoria County, so one out of five. And what did you say again for the uh, 10 to 19 accounts for 17% of our ca active cases in Peoria County. So we're now seeing a 37% total between 19 and up. Exactly, a 37% total between the 0 to 19 age range. And how is contact tracing done, with, especially with these younger? I mean, is that still ongoing and is it harder to do with younger groups or anything? So contact tracing continues to go. Our staff continues to work with school districts, families, uh, and children to really get an understanding of where cases are coming from, how we can stem it. A lot of what we're seeing is household transmission. So it's not necessarily, again, child to child in a classroom setting. It is a sibling, a parent, uh, someplace from the outside coming in, and then usually it's a parent or an unvaccinated adult in that child's life that gets ill, and then the student gets ill or the child gets ill. So again, it's really imperative, and I think a great uh, conversation to really also extend this to is what the newest health bulletin that came out from the CDC this week, which really urges pregnant women, postpartum breastfeeding women to get vaccinated. Um, you know, what we don't want to see and we're seeing in certain areas is women that are delivering, um, they are sick with COVID themselves, their children are sick, and they're having a lot of complications. And so that health bulletin that was released by the CDC really, again, reiterates the fact that Everyone who is eligible, which includes pregnant women and postpartum, really need to get vaccinated, especially you know, if you choose to do breastfeeding, because then you're going to be sp sharing the antibodies with your infants who, again, are not eligible for the vaccine. So really imperative for us to create that protectious layer around everyone. So I do not have data of currently who is hospitalized and whether or not they are pregnant, but uh, anecdotally, we do know that that is still an ongoing issue in our hospital systems. When you say the 37% figure, is that active cases right now? That is active cases. 37% are between 0 and 19 in Peoria County. And you mentioned it's not coming from the classroom transmission. Are you saying the main transmission is the household transmission? In the main transmission is a household unvaccinated adult, and that's what we're seeing is really spreading that through a, a family. Are we again still seeing that the act unvaccinated make up a large majority of the uh, active cases? Yes, we continue to see a large amount of our cases be unvaccinated individuals, but more so in the hospitalization numbers. I would say when you're looking at overall active cases versus just hospitalization, over 90% of our hospitalization cases are unvaccinated individuals. And we are going to have people that are vaccinated that get ill, but the severity of the illness is going to be significantly less because they are vaccinated versus if they are unvaccinated. 
And so just because you have an individual that is vaccinated that gets COVID, it does not mean that the vaccine failed. In fact, it protected them because of the severity of the virus they had was a lot less. And so they were not hospitalized, they were not put into the ICU, and they were not ventilated. Those are key distinctions to remember about the importance of getting vaccinated. So you say more than 51% of people in Erie County is now vaccinated, so are we starting to see an increase in people wanting to get the vaccine, and some of that vaccine hesitancy starting to trickle up a bit, or what would you say is the average? So you know, we have been in Peoria County sitting, I would, for the longest time, I would say 48%. That was like our magic number, and I kept watching it, wanting to hit that 50 mark. Um, I cheered the day we went to 50. And I think there's a lot of reasons why we're seeing an uptake in vaccinations. I think a lot of the employment, things that are now trickling in, a lot of the deadlines are coming on, so I think people are getting their vaccine. Uh, we're also hearing people that, for better or for worse, they wanted to get the vaccine, but it was not on the top of their to-do list. And so now it is, whether it's employment reason or the larger group we're seeing is people now having sadly had to experience firsthand through a family member or a friend or another loved one and watch them go through COVID. And that's really changing a lot of minds where it's no longer an abstract idea for them. It's seeing a person that they look up to, maybe it's a coach, maybe it's a, you know, a neighbor and seeing them deteriorate and that's really triggering them to actually get the vaccine. So I think we're all excited um, with the news that the FDA produced uh, this week. The data was given from Pfizer to the FDA to start reviewing. It still has to go through the full FDA process and then follow up with the ACIP. But we are planning. I think a couple of things that we started talking about is just working with our schools. Um, similar to what we did when the age range dropped to 16 um, and when it dropped to 12 for Pfizer. We really worked with our hospital systems to go in and help support school-based clinics whether it was during the day or in evening hours, to make sure we can um, get as many kids vaccinated or give them the option as quickly as possible. And so again, working with our school districts, whether it's having weekend clinics uh, throughout the community for families, because again, this is a younger population and my own children fall into this population. And I as a parent, you know, while I trust my school, I'm very comfortable with my school, I also recognize that I want to be present when they're getting their vaccine. So we need to make sure we do anything we can to decrease barriers and, um, and really have a health equity approach to make sure that families can access this vaccine when their children are eligible and as quickly as possible. We do have to walk our younger population through that. And I think um, we've had this experience with H1N1. It was a great training tool for us, uh, you know, almost 10 plus years ago when we actually had to do uh, vaccinations for that younger population. So working with families, recognizing that schools play a great role, community agents play a great role, and making sure that we were having those clinics at times that were available for families. The current data that the Pfizer presented was for um, five and older. Okay. I think the next round that we're all waiting for is the next group underneath that. And uh, from what Pfizer's announced, they're still hopeful that five to 11 would be sometime in approval or review would be sometime in late October. So hopefully in November we can start vaccinating. And for then the other age range uh, later on in the year or uh, possibly first quarter of the next. Do you have any idea of the 49% that's not vaccinated? Do you have any idea what percentage of that is not eligible, or are these kids 12 and under? Like, assuming hypothetically everyone 12 and under was vaccinated, would our vaccination rate be 60, 70 percent? So I think that's a great point. I, I think we're a little bit higher than that, and I believe if you go to the Illinois Department of Public Health website, they do um, make the denominator for 12 and older populations. Um, I would I would hazard us to be close to the into the 60 percentile for eligible, meaning 12 and older. Um, I know from just census data, about the 180,000 individuals that are considered Peoria County residents, about 40,000 are under the age of 12. So I, you, know, you can kind of do the math on that as well. Um, right now, uh, no, we do not. We do know that we currently have, um, of the hospitalizations reported, um, at minimum, um, 
One was under the age of 17. Currently. Currently. Mm -hmm. What do you make of the increase in percentage for the 30 to 39 and 50 to 59 percent? Is there a reason that we're seeing that in more middle-aged Americans? You know, I really can't uh, address why we're seeing it in the um, that 30 to 39 or that 50 to, to 59. I would say hazard for the 30 to 39, and again, it goes to child exposure, the household exposure. You know, for that younger population that is uneligible for vaccination, most of their parents are going to be in their um, you know late 20s, um, mid 30s. So it would correspond when we see a lot of household transmission that it is stemming from that those two age ranges because they would. Um, demographically co-locate together because they live in a household. Don't you all collect the data for like the percentage of the population that received the Johnson & Johnson versus the Pfizer versus the Moderna? We do have that data. Um, we are actually asking the state to um, continue to pull some more uh, data for us. I will say for the age range, I know I looked today, um, of 65 and older Peoria County residents, about half actually got Pfizer and half got Moderna. <laughs> so, it, so we do know that already out of the bat, half of our population that's over 65 is eligible for the Pfizer. Is really how we communicate with the other half that's going to be waiting to get that booster eligibility for Moderna, and hopefully that comes sooner than later. Well, for people who, you know, who are like, oh, darn it, I got Moderna, now I can't get the booster, there's also been studies that showed that the Moderna might have a little more longevity. Do you have anything to say about that for those folks? I think it's really key to recognize the fact that, um, you know, just because Pfizer came out with a booster does not mean necessarily that Moderna is going to be needing the same exact um, timeline or process that Pfizer did. They both are mRNA vaccines, but they are different. Um, and so because you've got Moderna and Pfizer's offering boosters right now, it doesn't mean that, one, you might not be needing a booster later on, but also it doesn't mean that your Moderna was less effective than a Pfizer. And so again, you know, patience is key. The science keeps coming, the data keeps growing, and so we'll know more as this goes through. Um, but just overall, because they both are mRNA vaccine, you know, it is pretty st a strong indication that you're going to need a booster of Moderna, whether it's eight months because Moderna has uh, has been shown to see have a little bit of a longer time range than Pfizer. It might be, but again, we're, we're all waiting for that data to come out. Is the health department getting the boosters now? Did you guys start that? Were you able to start it right away, or was there a delay like there was with the, the, uh, the third dose? Yeah. So the health department has started our process for offering Pfizer boosters. Um, we've always been offering the um, third dose for immunocompromised individuals for Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, the, the delays really are partly because once it goes through that process, we want to make sure we have standing orders in place to make sure we operationally give that and report accordingly to the CDC guidelines. But you are giving them We are. And so are, I think, the Walgreens in our communities and the other pharmacies as well. And again, it's just attesting to it. We don't ask for proof of um, meeting any of the criteria, the underlying conditions. The key is, though, you've had to have had Pfizer before. Um, right now we have a mix. Okay. So we do have walk-in availability, but we also know that people sometimes want to make sure that they have it at a certain time, and so we do allow for, uh, for appointments. But there is a walk-in, and I strongly encourage in, any in, individual that hasn't received their vaccination to come down to the health department. Um, we have walk-ins from 9 to 4. At all three vaccines are available. Okay. Do you have any data on how many boosters have been administered in the Tri-County, and what percentage of people who are eligible for so the question is whether or not we have data on the boosters. And first of all, you guys are asking a lot of data questions today, so I appreciate that as an epidemiologist. Um, but uh, more importantly, it's really difficult for us to make that distinction because when we enter it into our state registry system, it only shows up as a third vaccine of COVID. So if I'm immunocompromised, that's a third dose. But if I'm not, it would still show up as a third dose. But I, to make that distinction, we don't have a way in our system yet to pull that apart. So we asked the state the exact same question. So what we are monitoring overall is just trying to see if we can get data of how many third doses were given. And that's still pending. They do have to re kind of uh, write their code on that, uh, computer code at least, and so we can try to pull that data later on. 
Last but not least, I think this is important, um, and I want to reiterate, we are entering flu season. Um, Dr. Uh, Francisco said the same thing. I was lucky enough to get my flu vaccine today. Um, my 10-year-old got her flu vaccine today. That is something that we can do to protect our youth today, as well as we talked about this again. We're heading into a season where ICU capacity, taking COVID out of the mix, was always an issue this time of year as we talk about vac flu. So again, it's the same type of resources, the same type of needs that our hospitals have to work through. So if you wanted to help us out again, make sure you get your flu vaccine. It protects yourself, it protects your neighbors, your community, those that are not eligible for COVID, and also it keeps our hospitals running safely. So again, please get your, your flu vaccine as soon as possible. Um, are we anticipating a, blue, a bad flu season? You know, flu is always, we always look at the southern hemisphere to predict what our flu season looks like. And I think there's going to be a lot of nuances that come into play. One is how well we adhere to masking, social distancing, and all the same uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions that we do for any respiratory illness. And I think the other layer would be uh, vaccinations. I think last year we had a a lot of people uh, heard the call and got their flu vaccine more than usual. And we saw that when we had actually a less of a capacity issue regarding influenza in our hospitals. So again, it, it comes back to us as a community, what we're willing to do to take care of each other. And so doing those universal respiratory precautions as well as getting vaccinated, it, you know, might help us not have a severe flu season. Now, in terms of the RSV, I think a lot of that had to do with the seasonality, and we did go into a, a period where we stopped universal masking and we, some of our precautions went down, and it made a ripe environment for RSV to take hold. So again, it matters. These steps actually matter, and they work. Thank you. How long does the flu season usually, a, a typical flu season, how long does that usually run? Um, it, it varies year to year. Um, I know for the health department, we've been monitoring influenza seasons um, since 2014, and we usually start collecting data in November, and we end data collection usually around uh, late April, early May. It can vary. It can be a very short season, um, or it can be very long. It depends on which strain takes hold for that year. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone.